We've got a shell and tube heat exchanger with two shell passes and eight tube passes. Even though the figure looks like there's only four, there's actually eight. It's just the drawing would get really crowded if you drew all of them. But we've got given the final temperatures and we're looking for surface area. That means that this is gonna be an LMTD, log mean temperature difference problem. The other type of heat exchanger problem is an NTU, uh, net thermal units problem. That's gonna be where the size of your heat exchanger is known and you're looking for exit temperatures. So if you have size and you're looking for exit temperatures, that's NTUs. If you have exit temperatures, you're looking for a size, that's gonna lend itself towards a log mean temperature difference solution type. So shell and tube heat exchangers are gonna be a little bit different than regular parallel or counter flow double pipe style heat exchangers in that you need to apply a correction factor F. You'll still use the same main equation, Q is U A delta T, but again, you have this extra value F. So Q dot equals UAF delta T L M, where the delta T L M is the log mean temperature difference. And F is this correction factor, which accounts for the shell and tube design. So for this problem, the value U is given, the overall heat transfer coefficient is given, but we're gonna need to find everything else. So if A is the final answer, we need to somehow separately find Q dot, the heat transfer rate, F, the correction factor, and delta T, L, M. So basically three sort of parts to this problem before we can plug in to get the final answer. So for every heat exchanger problem, you're probably gonna use M dot CP delta T to find Q, the rate of heat transfer. And when using M dot CP delta T, you have to use uh, this only applies to a single flow of water, so you have to use like the inlet and outlet of just the ethyl alcohol, or the inlet and outlet of just the water. So this M dot CP delta T only applies to one stream. So for us, since we know the mass flow rate of the ethyl alcohol, I'll just go ahead and use that stream. So 2.1 meters per second is the mass flow rate of ethyl alcohol, uh, CP, 2670 was given, and I'm gonna make a couple of assumptions here. One is that the system's at steady state, so this mass flow rate is not changing, and also that the fluid properties are not changing. So technically, specific heat, CP, it changes as temperature changes. So as the ethyl alcohol heats up from 25 to 70, CP will change a little bit, but not very much. So we're gonna assume that the 2670 is constant, and we plug in the two temperatures, exit minus inlet, 70 minus 25. Again, this delta T is for the ethyl alcohol itself. We're calculating how much heat has been gained by the ethyl alcohol. And that turns out to be 252,000 watts or 252 kilowatts, where I'm being kind of careful with my units here that depending on what value of CP you look up, sometimes it's in terms of joules, sometimes it's in terms of kilojoules, so just be mindful that you could get watts or kilowatts depending on your units for CP. All right, well, that's one of the three turns down. Next one, let's go after the correction factor. So why do we even need a correction factor? And so the reason for that is our delta T LM equations. We've got one equation for parallel flow and one equation for counter flow. And this shell and tube heat exchanger is kind of like a counter flow double pipe heat exchanger in that when you look at the ethyl alcohol inlet, it's right next to the water outlet. And the ethyl alcohol outlet is right next to the water inlet. So that is, it seems like the water and the alcohol are flowing in different directions from inlet to outlet. But not always. In the middle, right, the tubes, the ethyl alcohol tubes actually snake back and forth four times. So in the, the second half of the water actually sees four different passes of the alpha alcohol. And then the inlet to the water, that first shell pass, sees another four passes of the ethyl alcohol. So it's kind of like counterflow, but a little bit more complicated because of all the zigzags. That's the reason for the correction factor. The good news is that you're just gonna look this up in a figure, this correction factor F. And you do have to be a little bit careful. There are different figures 
for different numbers of shells and tubes. So make sure you're looking at the correct figure for however many you have. In this case, we have two shell passes, eight tube passes. So I'm using the two shell pass, eight tube pass figure. <laughs> what a great idea. So to look up F on these figures, I have to calculate these values P and R, something for the horizontal axis. And then there's all these different lines, like which line am I actually looking at? So the value for P, and you really just have to be, every textbook is gonna have a slightly different version of this. So try not to be overly worried about the letters T and S and P and R. Just follow very carefully the picture for the figure that's in your textbook. So in the one I am using for this video, we've got T, T out minus T, T in over T, S in minus T, T in, that is P. So when I plug in numbers, this is the 70 minus 25 over 95 minus 25, because in my figure, this T flow is for the tube flow, right? And S is for the shell flow. This comes out to a value of 0.64. And then for R, TS in minus TS out over T, T out minus T, T in, right? This is shell in minus shell out over tube out minus tube in. 95 minus 45 over 70 minus 25 gets a value of 1.111. Now in some textbooks, you will be able to actually just look this up directly as is. However, in my particular textbook, it doesn't allow R values greater than one. It only plots up to an R of one. So you have to do a conversion. Again, your textbook might not need this conversion, but for mine, I do need to do this conversion. So instead of just looking up based on P and R, I can convert these and look up instead of P, PR, and instead of R, one over R. It's just a little mathematical conversion so that this table still works so that you can use the same values. Basically just makes the figure cleaner so that you don't have to plot as many lines. It's a little bit extra work mathematically, but it's a much cleaner figure as a result. So my one over R value, uh, one divided by the 0.64 is gonna be 0 0.90. And then P times R is gonna give me 0.714. So now I'm looking up in my figure at a P value of 0.714 at an R value of 0.90. And that gives me a correction factor F of 0.78. And that essentially represents an efficiency. This shell and tube heat exchanger is 78% as effective as a counterflow heat exchanger. And at first you might think, well, that's not very good. Why not just use a counterflow heat exchanger, which would have 100% the effectiveness of a counterflow heat exchanger. And the reason is based on size. A counterflow heat exchanger is a double tube style. So you have basically one pipe of ethyl alcohol and then one ring like an annulus flow of water directly around it. This takes up a lot of space. If you need a lot of surface area, you can still snake that sort of double tube design around, but it's still really big. If you wanna actually fit a humongous amount of surface area into the smallest possible space, you kinda have to use a shell and tube style design where you can just snake around one of the tubes and just have a, a big giant encasing, the outer tube that can hold like eight tubes inside of it, it's gonna be much more space efficient. So you are losing heat transfer efficiency in order to gain space efficiency. It'll take up less square footage in your power plant or factory or manufacturing facility. All right, two steps down, Delta T L M, last part. This is, has to be the counterflow LMTD equation, right? The shell and tube design is not parallel flow. The water and the ethyl alcohol are kind of, have their inlets and outlets matched up. So this is similar to a counterflow design. So we use the delta T LM counterflow equation. The one that has T hot out minus T cold in, 
because the hot outlet, the 45, is close to the cold inlet of 25, and T hot in minus T cold out because the hot 95 degree water inlet is right next to the hot 70 degrees ethyl alcohol outlet. So 45 minus 25 is 20, and 95 minus 70 is 25. So when we plug in all these numbers, we get 22.41 for delta T LMTD, which is what we expect. We expect it to be in between 20 and 25, that's 45 minus 25, and 95 minus 70, so that's 20 and 25, should be in between those two, kind of close to the middle, and 22.4 is very close to 22.5. So this value does make sense. If we got a value that was a lot different, check your calculator or replug in all the numbers again, you might have kind of fat fingered something on your calculator. So now we have all three expressions we were looking for. We can finally plug back into the original equation from the start, UAF delta T L M. So 252,000 is the rate of heat transfer 950 was the overall heat transfer coefficient. U, that was the value that was given to us. A is the final answer we are looking for. Correction factor F, 0 0.78. This is a, a percentage, it's like an efficiency. So this is gonna mean that we're only 78% as effective. And 22.41, that is the delta T LM log mean temperature difference for this two shell pass, eight, tube pass, heat exchanger, shell and tube style heat exchanger. Calculate the numbers, area 15.2 meters squared. For this example problem, you are given both exit temperatures, but you don't have to be given both. If you wanna see a practice problem with another LMTD heat exchanger, but one where you're only given one exit temperature and have to solve for the other one, that's the problem linked up on the screen here next.